Uh, I would suggest that first let them ask the questions today. So I keep my self there. If you have any questions, it's better to ask me first so that your mind is at rest. I would like to start. Am I better here or on the ground? <laughs> now, first of all, it's better to ask the questions because yesterday when we started this question session, people got a little deviated. It's better to ask questions now, what you have, because you are all seekers. You are all seekers and you have been. <coughs> so it's best just to ask questions now, so I'll be able to put the answer in between my lecture. Are you better today? I'm asking you. Mm -hmm. huh? I'll again see you today. That means Sahaja Yogis have become quite capable of explaining Sahaja Yoga and I am very proud of them. When I went to Australia, the newspaper people asked me, are there are all your disciples scholars? I said, no, they are very common people. They have to be very common and normal people. And they said, the way they know things, surprisingly we feel they are all scholars. I said, all scholarship is within yourself. All the knowledge is within you. If you only can get light there, you can see all that knowledge is within you. You don't have to go anywhere for your knowledge. It's all inside. Everything is built in. You are built in so beautifully to become your spirit. That I don't have to do much about it. It just works out. Only thing is, that one has to know what we should expect uh, to be the spirit, what should be our expectation. And that also logically you must understand. It should be a logical conclusion, not just because I say something, because you have become a member of some group, <coughs> because you have paid money somewhere. It's not that. Reality is what it is. And logically it has to be reality. The other day I told you about the left side, about the <coughs> past, about the subconscious, about the collective subconscious and the problems of the subconscious and the conditionings we get from material things, from matter. Matter is always trying to overpower the spirit. And this matter is overpowering us because we come from matter to begin with. But how does the spirit come out of it? <clears throat> what happens that we become the spirit? People have talked about self-realization. So many people have talked about second birth. Everyone has said that you have to be born again. There are many people who go about saying, I am twice born, self-certified. You can find all kinds of people in this world who are knowing that something has to happen, some breakthrough has to take place, something they have to see. Imagine at the time of Christ, there were not so many people who were sick. Nobody could talk to the disciples also much. They were just ordinary fishermen. 
very simple dream. <coughs> but today is the time when you find so many of seekers all over the world seeking what? What are you seeking? The seeking is of your spirit. Now this is also a very vague term to say you are seeking your spirit. Now what is this spirit supposed to be? And why should we seek this spirit? In our evolution, we are human beings. Our awareness is that of human beings. And this awareness of human beings is not the ultimate. If it was, we would not have been seen. It's not the end of it. We have to reach at a point where something more has to happen. Now how do we approach the subject logically? In our evolution, what has happened to us? We were animals, from there we became human beings. What is so special about human beings compared to animals? In the awareness of man, there is a new dimension. For example, you can take a horse to a dirty lane, he doesn't feel Anything, the dirt or filth or beauty, colors, nothing. Makes no difference. But if you take a human being through a dirty lane or a dirty uh, house, immediately he understands, he doesn't like it. So what has come into us is nothing but in our awareness, a new dimension compared to animals. Or we can say in very scientific way is that in our central nervous system we have developed a new awareness. Whatever is in our central nervous system, we are master of that. Supposing I feel this is hot, everybody will feel this is hot. If I say this is the color of this particular bird, Everybody will say the same thing. So whatever is the awareness of one human being, awareness, I am saying, not the myth, not the hallucination, but the reality, as far as his organs are concerned, sensory organs are concerned, or is just the same. A person who feels hot does not say that he feels cold. Not the other one will come and say it is cold. They all will say it is hot. So, one thing is that the truth is one, it cannot be two. And that whatever has to happen now in our evolution has to be in our awareness. Like a fish became a turtle. If a fish became a turtle, what happened to him? It is in the awareness of the turtle, it started feeling the mother earth. It lost something that fish had and it started feeling something. In the same way, in our evolution, if something has to happen, we have to be something more in awareness, more dynamic. For this, we can take help from the writings of so many people. For example, we can consider you as one of them who has talked about. You has said <coughs> you has said that when the breakthrough will take place, the human beings will become will become collectively conscious. Will become. He didn't say that you will all start doing the same thing or you start behaving in the same manner. No, he said you will become, you will be aware of it, not unaware. So when you are seeking the spirit, if the spirit has to enlighten you, in your awareness you are going to know something more than you have known so far. For example, you might feel it hot and cold today. But maybe with that awareness you might feel something different about it. He 
has said it very clearly that you have to become collectively conscious. So the becoming is the point in our evolution, nothing else. We become something else. In Sanskrit language, for example, they say, for a realized soul, for Indians, it's very common knowledge. It's nothing so much difficult to understand. He is called as a Dvija, the one who is born again. And also a bird is called as a Dvija, because a bird is born first as an egg and then it grows, matures and then suddenly it becomes a bird. And that is the parallel of realization. You also know that in the, on the Easter day we give eggs. It has the same symbol that we are eggs and we have to become the birds. So just now at this stage when we are human beings, we are just limited like an egg to grow up to a point where you can become the birds. All other sort of things people talk of is not the realization. Like, I may say that, all right, uh, if I mesmerize you very well, I can give you bottles and you might start sucking the bottles just catch you. Even knowing that you are doing something funny, you are doing it. You'll be compelled to do it because you are mesmerized. Any such activity that we fall into is not realization. Because whatever has happened to you, as human beings that you are, you have done no activity whatsoever. We didn't get our tails as monkeys to become human beings. It has happened spontaneously like a flower becoming a fruit. It's a living process. One does not realize that whatever has to happen to you is a living process, it's not a dead process. What we can do is all dead. For example, we can stand on our heads, we can jump, we can run. You can do all kinds of things, but that is not the living process. The living process is when you become something. And that becoming must be asked by all honest seekers. If you are not honest, then it's difficult. Or even if you are honest and you are misidentified with certain ideas you have read because you have paid for the book or you have paid for an organization, you have paid for someone, that's not going to help. What we have to see, what we become, and that's what yesterday I told that you become the master. You become the prophet. As Blake has said, that God of men will become prophets and they will have powers to make others prophets. So to be very honest with yourself, you should say, have I become a prophet? And can I make others prophet? This is a very simple way of looking at our realization and this is what you are capable of that you become the prophet because everything is within you. The whole machinery is within you. You are like a computer. You are just to be put to the mains if you start working. You have to just become that. And if you do not become that, then all other things, forming an organization and any such thing is of no use, is of no value. It's all, I can say, misguided. What have you got yourself? Supposing, I mean, if Ray has to say something, oh, mother saw a light and this happened and that happened, she has these powers and those powers, it's all useless. What is it to you? I may be the king of anything, so what does it matter to you? What has become of you is the important thing. And for that becoming, if I say there is everything placed within you, I have to prove it, that's all. This knowledge, is not unknown to us, actually. It's all been described from the time of Moses. Like the, they say, he says, the tree of fire. Now what is the tree of fire? Nobody knows. They just say there was tree of fire. But if you see the Kundalini completely enlightened, if you can see, it really looks like a tree of fire. And then it is said also in the Bible that I will appear before you like tongues of flames. Now what is that? No one explains, nobody knows. These tongues of flames are nothing, but these centers, when they are enlightened, you see them just like tongues of flames. But you need not see them. 
Because when you are outside the pavilion, you can see the pavilion. When you are inside, you don't see, you just see the hall. And that is why one should understand that it is not what we think should happen, but it is what will happen actually we should accept. So first we should get rid of our misidentifications with our eyes. That this will happen, that will happen, and this should happen, I should see a light, I should uh, fly in the air. There are many people who are paying money to fly in the air. I mean, it's absurd. Why do you want to fly in the air? I don't understand. They are paying much more money than they can for that, to, uh, than they would have to pay to go around the whole world. I really tell you by plane, if you travel, it won't be so expensive as you are paying for this flying business, this flying squad business. And what is that? We have to understand. What is that when we go for this flying? What are we getting into? And this method of mesmerism is so certain that you cannot understand. You just go on it. Like the same flying spot business, we had a uh, gentleman who was the director of the <laughs> academy, down with epilepsy, his wife down with epilepsy, the child down with epilepsy. And they all came down to me, they lost their houses, they lost everything, very less. This is what has happened to the flying of the whole joke. Now, one must realize that you cannot pay for your evolution. You cannot pay. It's very simple to understand. As I told you yesterday, that if you pay to this flower, will it become a fruit? It's a living process for which we cannot pay, it doesn't understand money. Living processes do not understand money. I have not known any human being, supposing he is suffering from indigestion, he puts some money there saying that now I pay you my stomach, now will you digest my food. Do we do that? In the same way, it is the highest of highest living processes for which you cannot pay. It's a very subtle thing to understand for human being because they believe that for everything one has to pay, otherwise it doesn't work out. You see, you go to a machine, you want to have a good, say, machine, you must pay, which works, you see. If it doesn't work, you can have free. But the one that works, we have to pay. Any motor car is free means it's all a junk. You can't have it. You have to pay to take it to the junk shop. So it is always in the minds of human beings that one has to pay. And this is very wrong that you cannot be. I'm talking of the processes which are beyond human. The human beings are not doing it. For example, we cannot transform a flower into fruit. The living process itself is beyond human reach. But when you become, when you become a superhuman, you can do it. And this should happen to you. If it does not happen to you, all the rest of the things are wrong. I am telling you with great concern because the people who are in the market, who are selling goods, are doing it very well. They know how to entice you, they know how to put ideas through you, how to give you misidentifications and you just get identified with them till they completely drop out. And then you are left high and dry. You say, oh God, what has happened? One thing is there, that your spirit is not lost. It is there. Despite whatever the mistakes, whatever may, uh, may be the seeking, but the spirit resides within you despite everything, till you live. And this spirit is to be brought into your conscious mind, means into your central nervous system. You should feel the powers of the spirit in your being. This is what is Sahaja Bhakti. Sahaja, as you must have told you, means born with you. Now yesterday I told you about the left side, which is the power of desire, and through this power we have our all conditionings and all the receptions from the matter, materialistic things, and also what you can say, we collect all our past. And the past then extend up to the collective subconscious. I also told you yesterday that cancer is a disease caused by the left side extreme behavior of people. 
those who go to the extreme behavior on the left side get the disease called cancer and it can be cured if you can bring such an extreme case in the center it can be cured no doubt about it now the second side is the right side which today i have told that i will tell you about the gentleman is not here who asked me question is here He was just busy asking questions. That's all yesterday. He's not interested in speaking. I think. All right. Now the second side, on the right hand side, is the power by which we act. First we desire and then we act. Now this power, right side power, is expressed within us as right sympathetic nervous system. Science has come from the same. Science is in the growth. These are all subtle things that are within us. Now this right side power, which exists within us, gives us the power. for our mental and physical capacity to act now this action takes place when we desire something we want to implement that desire then we go into action one has to understand what sort of a power is this this power is called as prana shakti in sanskrit prana and the another one the left one as mana shakti is the power of the emotions or can say of the mind but you see english language is not so clear cut about it so i would say mana shakti and prana shakti these are the two powers that exist within us and we start using them as left and right uh, we can say like a brake and an accelerator and then we become the master of driving but while becoming that we make mistakes the human mind has a speciality to go to extra supposing i tell somebody now you have to meditate they'll meditate for 5 hours there is no need to meditate for 5 hours or anything but if you tell them that you have to stand on your head they'll do it for 10 hours so there is no need to go to extremes we have to be just in the center be kind to our body be kind to ourselves there's nothing to be frantic about there's nothing to be so much exasperated about it it's just very simple thing that has to happen to you. for example think of a seat which is so in a very loud music or say a place where everybody is rushing shouting screaming what will happen to that seat will never sprout if it is in a peaceful place is a properly placed one or not in a tilted uh, pot then it will definitely develop into a beautiful uh, tree or a beautiful shrub whatever it is it has to develop into. in the same way if we are too much on the extremes we go to the left and to the right now going to the left i told you yesterday what happens that all these things <coughs> like hypnosis and esp and uh also these gurus try these tricks you see like they just uh, make you hypnotized and people become absolutely mad out over the guru he is our guru and they behave just like absolutely people without any brains So I feel no ice with it. The reason is that you feel there's a some sort of a sense of security built in in this gentleman, and uh, if I I'm following him, see he's going to heaven and I'm going with him. It doesn't happen like that. You have to individually go into heaven yourself, and you have to become your own guru, and you have to know everything about him. It. It's not that anybody can uh, put a uh, trailer behind and put some people into it and say now come along i am going to heaven most of these are people are really going to hell and you will follow them very fast so it is never so believe me that anybody who says that following a certain guru will go to heaven is absolutely wrong you must follow in the principle and every guru who is a real guru will always tell you will always tell you that you have to become some he will never just say all right you given me the money all right you are the member now you are my child now you are my disciple and i give you my love let's have love where is the love and give more money give me rolls royces give me this give me that at last man we are doing it thinking that we can exchange this now as we are seekers we have every right to find our spirit and we are not to be deluded by any such tricks and pranks of these people or i would say very sinister methods that they are employing not only to deceive you for money i don't mind there are smugglers let them have money what they want to have but they spoil your chances of realization which you do not realize and once they are spoiled it's very difficult to do realization 
And if you do not really positively work it out, it's going to be an impossible situation. I've seen people who have suffered on account of this. Now this action within us acts for our mental and physical capacities on the right hand side. Like we think of the future, now we're planning, we start, it's planning. Now we must do this tomorrow or day after tomorrow, we have to do it and we start sitting. Now I'll go there and I'll find this and then I'll take a ticket and then I'll go there. I mean, our mind is working for the future. So much so we become, we become absolutely futuristic. To such an extent sometimes I have met people who are futuristic, they even forget their own names. Can you believe it? I mean, they don't even remember their father's name, that's all right, but even their own names they forget. I mean, they are like mad <coughs> because they don't remember their own names and they don't know uh, where are they, what are they doing. I have met people of that kind who are really sick people because they have become so futuristic now that they do not know anything about their past. Now, this futuristic behavior starts in a society where people always think of the future. What will I do? What, uh, what am I to do tomorrow? What am I to achieve tomorrow? And all these things when they start doing, their attention goes to the right extreme. Now in this place, we are very dangerously placed, very dangerously placed when we start looking for the future. And the future uh, seeing is a imaginary stuff, is absolutely imaginary. Because what you think of the future doesn't exist. What exists is the present. You have to be in the present, not in the future. But people will say you have to be in the, in the present. But how? We cannot. Either we are in the past or in the future. Because when the thought wave rises, it comes up and goes down. Another thought wave rises, goes up and comes down. Now, this thought wave which comes up, we go with it, but we don't see it's going down. Another thought wave that rises, we, we see that, but we don't see where it goes out. And so we are jumping on the cusp of these thoughts and we do not know. Perhaps we are in the past or perhaps with the future. But in the center of these two thoughts, there is the present. And we don't know how to take our attention there, which is a very difficult thing. And just to say that you should be in the center is not possible. All these things, you should do this, you should do that, is not going to work out unless and until there is light. For example, there is no light in this room. And you say, walk straight. You cannot walk because you can't see where is the passage, how to walk. Even if you order to whatever you please, you cannot just walk straight without touching any of these chairs because there is no light, you can't see. So one has to understand that in the futuristic life when we live, when we plan too much for the future, actually what we are doing, we are living in an imaginary world. Uh, we have many stories of people who lived in imaginary worlds and how they found that everything was destroyed. And there are people who work it out through their physical efforts and when they go into their physical efforts, they create another problem for them because they just become physically oriented people. And if you are just physically oriented, the spirit gets angry. So the right side movement is for the people who are very meticulous, you see what you can call the people who are very particular about the time, and who are very uh, firm about things, who are very dry people and who are very straight and they won't tolerate any nonsense, that sort of people you see that you find normally. And that sort of people become a headache and they are very boring. You can't just bear their company, they can be very boring people. And they give you big lectures about how to be straight forward and how to walk straight, absolutely. In the nature, nothing is straight. It all moves so beautifully because the nature is created out of varieties. And variety brings the beauty. They don't think of beauty, they don't think of love or compassion, nothing. For them, it is a very meticulous world and that's how they live. Such people are developing a big ego within themselves, as you see there. In the yellow stuff in the head called as ego. Let me show. Right. By the action of the left side, emotional side, we develop a super ego, but by the action of the right side, we develop an ego. Now, this ego is not easy to be seen because if you have a super ego, 
you have pains in the body, you are a miserable person, you have wrinkles on the face and you look absolutely burned out. But if you have ego, then you look so dynamic. We can say that Hitler was the extreme of this ego business. And he got into his head that he is some sort of a uh, God <coughs> incarnation and that he has to save the people and he was the one uh, who knows about races and everything and he is supposed to save some race. This kind of idea comes from these people who are right-sided. They are very aggressive, they may be very good uh, to talk to, they may be very humble to look at, uh, could be very good businessmen, could be anything, but they do not know that they have this Mr. Ego coming up on their heads just like a big balloon and they are floating in the air. The end of ego is stupidity, you will be surprised. The end of ego is stupidity. Such people indulge into all kinds of stupid things and they say, what's wrong? For example, I have known old people behaving in so stupid ways and they say, what's wrong? You know, an old man say of 90 years who can't even walk without a stake takes to these uh, dances you do and then he falls down, you see, and he thinks, what's wrong? Like a lady I knew, she was about 85, she died from a horse falling down. Naturally, when, what else do you expect at 85? That's what is evident. For a lady of 85, she should, she should settle down at home, look after her grandchildren, maybe she might have a great grandchildren, you see. Instead of that, why does she want to be 25 year old uh, lady uh, to climb on a horse? So all such stupid things they do and then they will say, what's wrong? It's nothing wrong in stupidity, what's wrong? But <laughs> such people are a nuisance to the society, to others. The people who are super ego are troublesome to themselves. But those are egoistical are troublesome to others. They are all the time correcting others, torturing others putting their ideas onto other people and such people can be very, very successful because uh, nothing succeeds like success. They go on ham hammering things into the heads of people saying, now this is true, this is true and when you go on saying it, you should suddenly believe, yes, must be so. And such people are much more dangerous, I would say, from the superego type. But for people who do not know the tricks of the superego, they can be very, very uh, very dangerous because they are very subtle, you cannot see them. They mesmerize and uh, they can possess you and they can, can be very sly and they can work out all sorts of methods which you are not aware of. So it is not easy to choose which is better, which is not better. Both things are wrong to go to extremes on the right or to the left. Now let's see what happens physically. Uh, as I told about the cancer, the left hand side that we do. Physically what happens to people who are futurist? We have a center especially for futuristic behavior called the Swadhisthana Chakra which is uh, in the gross manifesting the, uh, the plexus called the aortic plexus within us. Now this Swadhisthana Chakra is very important for human beings especially for people who are developed. With this uh, chakra actually we convert the fat of the stomach for the use of the brain. Now this is the center of the surya, of the, uh, of the sun. Now when we start thinking, these cells are converted in such a way that they become useful to the brain. Now if you are thinking all the time, all the time you are thinking, then what will happen? I mean the horns are not going to grow out of that. You are consuming all that and when you are consuming all those cells, you have to have replacement and for that replacement this Swadhisthana Chakra has to work very hard to convert the cells for the use of your brain. Now when he's, it is doing that, uh, there are other things which this Swadhisthana Chakra has to look after. For example, your liver, your pancreas, your spleen, your kidneys, all are to be looked after by this center and also you just for the ladies. Now when there's only one work is given to this Swadhish Thaicha uh, and it cannot do any other work, then other things are neglected, so you develop a terrible disease called liver trouble. Now liver trouble is another thing that you do not feel yourself. Others know that your liver is the way you are hot tempered, 
the way you are fussy, uh, the way you always snarl at people, and the way you are uh, never satisfied with anything, the way you criticize others, all this is liverish. And such liverish people uh, are never happy with themselves because liver looks after their attention. And those who have liver problems, their attention is horrid. That goes like this. See, you cannot keep your attention straight. On the street, you will walk straight into a car because you are looking at something which you are not supposed to look. But all the time you are looking at like this, you cannot walk. I mean, you won't find any animal like that who walks like this. But only human beings do it. If you see them on the street, you will be amazed. Where are they walking? They don't walk straight. They don't walk straight. But their eyes are going this way, that way. Because the attention is wobbly. The attention is wobbly because of a bad liver. So this liver is a very, very important thing. Now this liver has a special capacity to extract all the poisons from the body as heat. And the heat in the body is to be transformed or should be conveyed to the blood or the water in the blood. And that has to be taken out of your body, maybe as perspiration or in another form. But what happens? that when this liver is out of gear, it cannot it cannot pass this heat into the bloodstream and the heat remains in the body and you really be, become heated and that heat makes all these problems for you. So in Sahaja Yoga what happens that when Kundalini rises, she changes the form of the blood. The hydrogen and oxygen which are placed because of this heat and all that, in a very funny way, like this, like that, and they start receiving the heat within them. That's why those people who have bad livers feel little heat when the Kundalini rises. But one can cure it by giving it that peace and comfort to that liver organ, and you can definitely cure your liver, no doubt about it. Then the second thing that happens to you is, is the pancreas, which gives you diabetes. Only a person who thinks too much gets the diabetes. For example, an Indian farmer doesn't know what diabetes is, but then you stop your sugar, but that's not the way to stop your diabetes. Diabetes comes to you because you think, 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 think too much. The doctors won't understand this. That's why they say it is incurable, but that, because they cannot connect thinking with the disease. And this is what happens when you are all the time thinking like mad, then diabetes takes place. And this diabetes is also curable if you get your enlightenment. You can cure also the diabetes of other people, but because this vital power, which is integrated of all these three powers, flows through you, and you can uh, replenish, you can uh, give more to other people who are exhausted of it, and sort of you can fill them up with this power and you can get it. The third one is the worst of all that happens to people is blood cancer because of spleen. Spleen is one thing very important, that it is the center of peace within us. The one who doesn't have a proper spleen cannot be peaceful person. Now, it's a very simple thing, but doctors cannot connect it, nor all science-oriented people can connect it to something very, very simple. And the simple thing is that when we eat our food, if we are frantic, we are out to get trouble with the spleen, and we can get blood cancer. Now, if the mother is of that temperament or a father is of that temperament, the children might be born with blood cancer. Now, we will be happy to tell you that in New York, we had a case of blood cancer. And when I was in, in, in India, in a village, somebody came and told me that such and such boy is sick, is only 16 years with blood cancer, and doctors have declared that he's going to die within two weeks' time. They always declare, they're good at declaration. And when this case came to me, I told them that I cannot do anything, I am in a village, but you can telephone to one of the Sahaja Yoginis. Uh, she was in England, now she is in New York, and she will look after this case. You will be amazed that the boy was cured completely. He came out of the hospital, came to see me, and now he's gone back to his studies. I mean, like this we have cured many cases of blood cancer. But here we are not to cure people by any or healing anyone. That's not our job. It happens spontaneously as a byproduct of the Kundalini awakening. Main thing is we have to make you doctors. We have to make you knowledgeable people. We have to make you 
collectively conscious human beings who have to enter into the kingdom of God to reside there in his peace, place and joy. Now this trouble of also of kidney, of high blood pressure, all that is due to this. People worry, they are frantic, you see, and this franticness comes to us just as a matter of habit. I've known people, as soon as you say, oh, you have to go by aeroplane or somewhere, suddenly the aeroplane word triggers that frantic, oh, they get mad. They don't know what they are up to. They will forget their passport, they will forget their luggage, they will forget this, they are frantic. At the airport if you go, you will find this left nabi, as we call it, this center is, the spleen goes frantic. Now, when you eat your food or do any such work, there is an emergency created and more blood is needed to digest that. So this spleen, poor thing, works very hard to create that extra amount of blood cells. But at the time you are eating, you are also, see, reading a newspaper. That's the worst thing one should do in the morning. Horrible. You read the newspaper, you are eating the food, the spleen goes off because another emergency comes up. Then you get onto your bicycle, eat a sandwich in the hand, it's even worse than that. <laughs> As you are rushing to your work, suddenly you find a big jam on the way, then you are even very badly placed with the situation and you get so frantic and you don't understand. And the person who is in front of you goes on saying, oh, what's wrong with this fellow? Why can't he drive fast? And the, the same fellow is saying something exactly the same to the another fellow who is going ahead. So this mad race is on, this rat race is on. And if you are eating your food in such a hurry and in such franticness, you develop this trouble which is very dangerous called as blood cancer and among young people is very common. Now, for the last and not the least is the trouble of the heart. When you pay too much attention to all these outward things, to material things, to your uh, all material advancement, to your physical advancement and to so much of computerization of your brain, then you neglect the necessary attention to your spirit which resides in your heart. And so the spirit receives. And when the spirit receives, you get a heart attack. Only a person who is right-sided gets a heart attack and never a person who is a left-sided. Uh, I told this to a doctor and he told surprisingly that in a mental hospital we never need a cardiogram. We do not need it. They never get a heart attack. A madman never gets a heart attack. Surprising. A person who is mad is using his heart, his left side, his emotions, and his heart should go off. But no, his brain goes out. Can you imagine? And the one who uses the brain, his heart goes out. This is the balance created by nature in us. See how cleverly the nature is trying to guide us in the center. Don't go to the extremes. Keep to the center keep to the center and then when you are absolutely in the center, then you get your evolution very quickly. So this is the right side that we have, the futuristic side and as you know we are all very futuristic by temperament. Uh, this futuristicness cannot be cured by telling, oh now don't think. You cannot do it. You just cannot do it. If I order you that now you uh, better stop planning. You just can't do it. You can't help it. You, you have to do that kind of plan. And you find all these plans fail because these plans are not related to the plans of the Divine. Divine has some other plans. Why well, you have some other plans? And they never uh, combine together and that's how you find all your plans fail and you are just frustrated, left high and dry, you don't understand how it has happened. For your understanding, one has to know that there is a divine power. You may like it or not. All this living work that is done, millions and millions of flowers which are becoming fruits, a seed becoming a tree, a particular seed becomes a particular tree, the, all the choices that are made, the whole organized way, the chemical uh, acts, the way the chemistry <coughs> is made of periodic laws, everything you see in this world is all so well organized, there has to be somebody doing it. So there is a divine power which is surrounding us, no doubt about it. 
But we have not yet felt. That's all. If you have not felt it, that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. It does exist. And it works out. We have seen with our own experience that so many living things are happening, we just take it for granted. We are not bothered. See, in human life itself, a child is to be born. Then a fetus is held in the body. Normally, the law of medical science is this, that anything foreign, if it enters into the body, is thrown up immediately. All the forces are built up to throw it up. But what we find that when a fetus is built up, the whole system works out to nourish it, to look after it, to really to bother about it. Very carefully, the water is created around it so that it is not disturbed and every sort of a care is taken by the body to look after the fetus and when the fetus is ready, it is thrown out. Who does that? Who does that? We must ask these questions to ourselves sometimes. After all, why have we become human beings? What was the need? What was the need? And if you haven't got the answer, that means we are still in transition and we have to get there where we get the answer. We are made human beings to feel that divine power, to maneuver that divine power and thus enjoy the bliss of divinity. That divine power is the collectivity. That gives us collectivity. The spirit in our heart is the one which is the collective being within us, which manifests that divine power to flow through. And that's how, once we are connected to the means, we start becoming what we are for. Like a machine, once it is put to the means, it gets its meaning. But this machine, though it is put to the means, is not aware of the electricity, about my voice, anything. But a human being, when he gets connected with the means, when he becomes aware, and this is what you must see. When you get realized, you can raise the Kundalini of others. You can give realization to others. Ray himself has done to so many. Even in Riyadh he did it. He did it everywhere, wherever he went. He's just like you. He's an engineer. He's just like you. He was just like you. And now we'll be amazed at how much he knows about himself and about us. And the complete change has come because once you get the spirit, when you get the highest, all these mundane things drop out and you become a master of yourself. No more enslavement of any uh, habits or anything. It just works out beautifully. But one must give a chance to oneself and one must have patience. The worst part of intelligence, so-called, is that you can make fun of it. That's the easiest way to make fun of everything and get rid of it. In olden times, when they wanted to face the reality, like when Christ came in, they didn't make fun of it. But they did at the time when he was crucified, but uh, they just denied. But now it is not basically a problem. That problem doesn't exist, because to deny is, it requires more effort. So it's better to make fun. It's stupidity, again, as I said. It's stupidity to make fun of something. Because you are that. You are the spirit. You are the one who has to get it. And if you just know how to make fun, please go and play about with it. All your life will go on, all your lives will go on. What's the use? And if you do not get your realization, in the words of your judgment, you have failed. You have failed and there is a chance given to you. You can be comforted and you can be counseled, you can be redeemed, but nobody can make you taste the beauty of your own being, that you have to do it yourself. If you do not want to do it, all right, it's perfectly all right. You are free to do it, do what you like. But if you want to do it, then please stop your guru shopping and wobbling. Stop and see for yourself what you need. It's a serious thing we should have. Unless and until human beings are evolved, none of the problems of the world are going to be solved. None of the problems, take it from me. Whatever they have done by their thinking, say they have created democracy, they have created uh, uh, communism, this, that, all this nonsense, has no meaning at all in reality. It has no meaning. Because say, for example, you might say, I'm very powerful, so I'm a capitalist. But I can't live without giving to others, so I'm a communist. I have a complete capitalist and a complete communist. Everything exists within me. 
And these ideas are all artificial that you make some set of people as democratic and some people as this thing. Because as long as they are attached to selfishness, to all these things, they are not going to do any good job. Now, the detachment take, takes place because you become one with the spirit, which is not attached, which gives you that light, that detachment, from where you can see the whole thing just as a drama going on, and you work it out very well. You become so dynamic, so dynamic, that you are amazed at your own dynamism. Apart from that, one has to realize, if there is a power, which is an all-pervading power, that power itself thinks, organizes, and looks after. So many things have happened to such yogis. <laughs> if I have to tell you all about it, you would be amazed. Amazing things have happened. But Krishna has said very clearly, yoga kshema vahamyam. Means when you get the yoga, you get the well-being. After yoga. He said yoga first. First the union must take place, then you will get the well-being. Now I have seen people who go to so-called gurus and things sick. You see their faces pale, absolutely finished. They are good for nothing, absolutely miserable people. And how such people would be in yoga? Not only physically, mentally they are at peace, they are full of compassion and love. And the compassion that doesn't talk but just flows, it flows, it emits. You can give your compassion even to flowers. If the flowers are dying, you can give them this and they will live for a while. If there are, say, trees which are dying, if you give them, they will prosper. If you give it to animals, they will be different because first time, after getting this power only, you are giving back something to the nature. So far you have been always taking from the nature. Now it is the first time you start giving something to the nature. Because the compassion just flows. It doesn't receive it, it just goes to others. And this should happen to you. Don't be satisfied with cheap things, with something nonsensical, which is something sort of a uh, mimicry or a mass idea. I'm talking of collectivity, where every individual is aware. It's not a mass activity, it is collectivity. May God bless you. I hope today many will get realization and become one with their spirits and will feel their collectivity. That's only my hope is. Right and I place very high up in England, and I always said England is the heart of the universe. It's very important that it is the heart. No doubt, and that's why Blake has said that it has to become Jerusalem. There's a lot of truth in what he has said. Lots of things he has said about Sahaja Yoga is absolutely true. But the heart is sluggish, heart is sleepy, is a sad. Like I say, that Europe is a liver and it is drinking. Can you imagine what will be the state of affairs of the sick worse if everything is going against one's own uh, essence? And the essence of, of English is that it is the heart. That means it articulates, it circulates. Whatever happens in England is taken up seriously. Supposing you become, all of you, stupid people, the whole world will become. The responsibility is such a lot on you, which you do not realize. It's a very important thing that we are doing. It looks very small in this country because the very few people who really come to Sahaja Yoga and settle down. Very few people. There are very few of that caliber, I think, young, Little children are there, many will come up by about, say, uh, ten years or so, I'm sure there will be a very good quality of people will be coming. And the seekers who are here are also sort of little nervous because they want to learn from Americans and from Europeans. There's nothing to be learned from. It is you who are going to circulate. You are going to carry the message. I know it's a very important country and somehow it was managed that my husband would get his election done in England and we are here now for the last eight years. Can you believe it? And I'll be here maybe again four years more at the most. So I hope something will happen and this Brighton, which is a very good place. I'm sure here also many will get their realization and will help in the emancipation of human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you. If you have any questions, you must ask me. It's in all frankness, I must tell you, I'm your mother. I never feel offended. You ask me a question, it's important, because actually I have no question. You have to ask me. I have no question at all. 